Krajem rujna 2019. u Puli je održana 16. konferencija Međunarodne udruge za svjetlost. U prošloj emisiji upoznali smo razne sugovornike i razne inovativne smjerove istraživanja u rasponu od pravih svjetlosnih postrojenja preko biogeometrije do tehnika poboljšanja vida. Danas ostajemo u posjetu konferenciji koju je organizirala ILA, International Light Association, s kolopletom novih tema od neobičnih uređaja do novih spoznaja o utjecaju svjetlosti na sve, pa tako i nas. Taj utjecaj nije zanimariv ni ovdje, na rubu znanosti. I'm one of the people that's been involved in this for a very long period of time. And a lot of the people in this organization first gained an interest in light because maybe they saw my first book, Light Medicine of the Future. Dr. Jacob Lieberman, our doyen, he is the oldest among us. Today he has won the award for life. The award of McMenamin, called for jednoj našoj preminuloj članici koja je osnivačica International Light Association. Po njoj je imenovana ta nagrada. Jacob Lieberman je to zaslužio svojim radom i uspjesima i knjigama koje je napisao na temu svjetlosti kao ljeka. Od njih je na hrvatski jezik prevedena knjiga Svjetlost ljeka budućnosti i skinite svoje naočale i progledajte. And so what's happened since then is that not only many people got involved in light that were not involved before, but may, many industries were developed. A lot of people started making special light for inside that is closer to sunlight. There's a lot of companies that make tools for healing that have to do with light that became inspired after my first book. So this award today was um, a thank you for whatever contributions that I was able to make, which I was very grateful. In the early 1900s, like 1902, the Nobel Prize was won by a man named Niels Finsen, who discovered that light could be used to cure a certain type of of tuberculosis and in, for instance, in Switzerland, they would have clinics at the top of the highest mountains where people would go and they would take off their clothes and lay outside and receive sunlight and actually be cured from many, many different kinds of diseases. So people have known throughout history that light is the source of health. So for instance, most people are aware that a plant cannot live without light, but very few people are aware that our bodies run on light. And it is just as important for us to receive light as it is a plant. And so all of the functions of the body are light dependent. And so throughout history, People have noticed this in one way or another. They may have just experimented using different colors of light or making rooms that had glass of different colors and laying inside, allowing the sun to go through the colored glass and impact the body. I got very interested in this in the 1970s, in the early 1970s while I was working as an eye doctor and started using these things to help heal vision problems. But then I realized that people were responding to colors in very different ways. A color you might be comfortable with may be very uncomfortable for me. And what I began to notice is that there was a relationship between the colors you liked 
and things in your life that felt comfortable to you and the colors you didn't like and things in your life that were uncomfortable for you. And so a lot of my work over the years, especially now, deals with helping someone to be able to respond to all the different colors of the spectrum uh, from a place of neutrality or feeling comfortable with all the colors. So one of the things that I've found is let's, let's imagine someone is uncomfortable when they think about or visualize or look at a red light. What I notice is that very often they also develop problems in that part of the body, what they call the first or second chakra of the body. So what I found is that there's a relationship between the colors that people don't like and where in the body they develop problems. And I also found that when people get comfortable with colors that used to feel uncomfortable, certain things that used to disturb them in their life no longer disturb them. The way that I do it with people, and uh, over the years I developed many different kinds of equipment and so on that doctors and therapists would use on their patients. But I wanted to make something that was available to people to use at home very affordably. So I created a little kit with some very simple glasses. They're just made of cardboard. And each one has special filters in them, all different colors, everything from a very deep ruby color, like a red, all the way to purple, magenta, scarlet, and so on. And I set up a protocol where every day they put the colors on, just a few of them, and they just breathe. Maybe you've noticed when something stresses, when you experience something that doesn't feel comfortable in your life, it makes it more difficult to breathe. So when someone puts on a color, if the color reminds them of something unpleasant, it's not easy for them to breathe. So I have the person just breathe maybe one to five times with each color, depending on how comfortable they feel. And each day they do this, and every week they increase the number of breaths. And after a while, they become comfortable with what used to feel uncomfortable. I'll give you an example. There are things in your life that you're very comfortable with. People, let's imagine you work with certain people each day, and some of them you like very much. But maybe there's others that you don't get along with. You don't know exactly why, but you just don't have a good connection with them. And when you encounter them, you have a little bit of a reaction. Maybe you've experienced this with an ex-husband, an ex-wife, a parent, or a child. So what I found is that when people have those things in their life, and most people do, there's usually certain colors they're uncomfortable with. And when they get comfortable with those colors, just by spending a little time with them at home each day, those relationships become easier for them. And so when the aspects of life that used to feel uncomfortable become more comfortable, there's less stress. And when there's less stress, there's greater contentment. We feel ha happier in our life. You know, when we don't understand things, we often say, ah, it's witchcraft. It doesn't work. There's nothing to it. Um, there was an Indian man named uh, Dinshaw P. Gadiali, and he developed a, a system he called spectrochrome, where he would have lights, large sets of lights of different colors that would shine on the body and through the eyes. And he claimed extraordinary levels of healing, and he had an entire system which some people still use today. In the vision care field, there was a man named Harry Riley Spittler, and he developed a very complex system, but his light wasn't going on the body, it was going directly through the eyes. All of these things were thought to be out in the fringes, you know, something that's way out, something that's not traditional, something that has no science, because 
Keep in mind, we understand very, very little about life. Very, very little. So most of what science is doing is trying to discover things that are not visible to us today. So these people that work with colors were visionaries. They had an instinct or a feeling about something and they began to experiment with it and they found that it was effective, but we didn't understand how it worked. So we said, ah, it's impossible. It cannot possibly work. When my first book came out in 1991, Light Medicine of the Future, I was sharing with the public all of the current uses of light because the science was like being rediscovered on a new level, even though this is a very ancient practice from biblical times. Now, most everything that I predicted in that book has come true. Now, light may be the hottest area of science. To give you an example, most people think, when they think of light, they think of eyesight. But only about 25% of the light uh, has to do, that enters the eye, has to do with eyesight. Most of the light that enters the eye goes into the portions of the brain that run everything in your body, all of the life-sustaining functions, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the stress response, the immune system, and so on. And very recently, we discovered something fantastic. We used to think that the eye is designed to receive light because it sees. Now we've discovered that perhaps all the cells of the body have eyes that are designed to detect and respond to the subtlest amount of light, single photons of light. So we've known for a long time that the body is light dependent. Our physiology is totally dependent upon light in the same way as a plant. Now we're beginning to realize that light is not just nourishing, but it guides us through our lives. Think about it. Everything that you do, every step you take in your life is guided by your eyes, right? But something is calling your eyes to look a certain way. And most of us think we are looking for things, but in America, we have an expression, we say, it caught my eye. Something grabbed the attention of my eye and caused my eye to turn, and then the body turns, and that lets us know what is the next thing in our life that we're supposed to pay attention to. Most of the time, we do not control the movement of the eyes. They're moving all the time. Anything that grabs the attention of the eye, the eye moves towards it, and then if it's critical, it moves us toward it. So it is not the eye looking for the light, it's the light looking for the eye. So the, uh, the light is not only a nutrient, sunlight is the most powerful nutrient on the planet. Keep in mind, most of us believe that I live, I get nutrition from the food that I eat. But only one third of the energy that our cells make is because of the food we eat. Two thirds is because of the light we ingest. So the body is taking in light all day long and it is causing the cells of our body to create energy. 50% of the sun's light comes out in the portion of the spectrum that is red and near infrared. And that portion of the spectrum is what turns on every cell in the body to make large amounts of energy for every function that your body has to do, from cellular repair to your DNA to everything else. So light is absolutely critical. We cannot live without light, and its effect uh, on the body is just a small piece of it, very small piece of it, because it has a very powerful effect on the psyche,
and it has a very powerful effect on the spirit. This is why when people awaken, we say, oh, they are enlightened. They have seen the light. They have seen something. This is why when you see pictures of Jesus and other people that supposedly were very wise, you see light around their head. That wasn't something that the artists just put in. It is that literally these people are bright. They're very bright, almost like a light bulb. And just like uh, insects are attracted to a light, people are attracted to other people that seem to give off a lot of light. So the way that our ability to take in the full spectrum of sunlight not only impacts every aspect of our health, but also impacts our evolution as human beings, our awareness as human beings, our ability to relate with life. So there's no part of our life that can be separated from light. Before we had penicillin and antibiotics, light, ultraviolet and blue light was used because it was antibacterial and very often it's interesting today when people are in a hospital, very often their rooms with artificial light and sometimes there's very little windows. Back then, when people were sick, they would take them outside because they knew intuitively the power of the sun to give life, to help the body to regenerate and so on. So I've been using light for 45 years now. When I started, I was just experimenting to see what was working and how it worked. Everything that I've learned about light, I've learned from experimenting to see what was the direct impact upon each person. I mentioned a few moments ago that the cells of the body have eyes that are able to detect and respond to light. There's about 35 trillion cells in the body. Each of them can see light and respond to light. They take in the information from light and literally they use it to repair the DNA. So when there's damage in the DNA, literally light can be used to repair that and the cells do that automatically if we're able to take in the light. How does this relate to my own work? If somebody says I'm uncomfortable with the color red, my sense is that their system has difficulty taking in this color. And so there's a part of the system that's dependent on that portion of the light spectrum that is remaining in the dark. When there are certain colors we don't like, my feeling is we take in less of those colors and certain parts of our system do not receive those wavelengths of energy. And my sense is the DNA is impacted by that, certain portion of our DNA. Light has profound effects on physical healing. That used to be very, very interesting to me. Now I'm less interested in treating things in the body. I'm not practicing as a physician anymore. Now I just like to help people with the quality of their lives because we all say we want to be healthy and happy. But if we're not happy, it's almost impossible to be healthy. And so I find that there's a direct relationship between our ability to feel happy and content in our lives and how we respond to colors. And so I've been using the things that I discovered over the last 45 years to help people in that way. I started in Vienna 32 years ago already, and I was a pioneer on the field, field of holistic color consulting in Vienna. That's about which colors suit persons. It's about personal color consulting. Gabriele Bure Steichmann is our president. She lives in Beču. She has her own practice. 
исцеления бојама, значи ту е нагласак на бојама, мање на светлости у нејзината пракси. Осим тоа, она е советодавец везано за уредување интериера. So first I was working many years as a color consultant, and the work, this work made me so fascinated about the deep impact colors do have. First, starting with grooming, clothing, or interior design. That after seven years, I did further studies in the UK about color light therapy, and then I started to work in Vienna as a color light practitioner. And I was also a pioneer in Vienna on this field. Uh, now working 26 years, and I've been working with three different methods of color light therapy: uh, the Hygieia color light therapy after Theo Gimbel. I've been working with a light spectral receptivity system from Dr. Jacob Liebermann and also with the monochrome color dome of Karl Ryberg. So I'm experienced with three different uh, methods. I'm really fascinated by color and light and it is my vocation. I'm also a systemic constellation facilitator, combining this work also with color and the effects, psychological effects of, of color. And when I visited for the first time an ILA conference, this was in the year 2011, it was in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, I was completely fascinated uh, at once by this very diverse community. And I remember very well that um, I was, I thought it, it's very awesome to find a group of people where you have on one side the researchers and the scientists and the, on the other side the practitioners, therapists, but also creative and spiritual people and they form one group and listen to each other and I think actually that that is what light does, light combines uh, scientific effects but also uh, psychological and spiritual effects. Well, I believe that light, light and color are a medicine of the future, of the present and the future. I believe that this is a, 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 an energy, a healing energy that is going to win a lot of recognition in the coming years. Uh, and this because it is known that actually we are, we humans, we are materialized light. And it's also known that our cells communicate over light. And uh, it looks like um, modern medicine, because of course the pharmaceutics and so on have become so important, have kind of pushed this a little bit aside. The whole thing uh, started when I was a child, I had a near-death experience, so uh, surely this was the cause that I was uh, studying psychology uh, to find out what it was that happened to me. And during my studies of psychology, I found out that even uh, the near-death experience itself is very hard to, um, to make science on it uh, because we don't know so we do know so little about our brain and what it is possi what, what's possible for our brain. But there was a intense science, especially by Kenneth Ring from America, about the therapeutical uh, effect of near-death experience. Engelbert Winkler is Austria je došao u Pulu održati radionicu na temu heliotropnog disanja, pomoću kojeg se postiže posebno hipnagogičko iskustvo. So I learned that many people who had near-death experience after their experience, which is usually some minutes, uh, they have profound changes in their uh, behavior and in their experiencing. And the whole personality sometimes changes in a way uh, that for a therapist it's extremely interesting to see that it is possible that an extreme experience which lasts just for some minutes can have an effect which uh, you would be proud of after many years of psychotherapy. So I started to um, integrate it in my uh, therapy because I had a therapy training at that time as a hypnotherapist and also as an existential analysis in the tradition of Viktor Frankl whom I uh, know personally at that time. Um, and Frankl always said health 
is a state of mind which is so deep within us that it is not uh, possible for diseases or sicknesses to reach it. And uh, people who are, get sick, they just lose touch with their own health, uh, with their own uh, state of health. So this uh, made much sense uh, from the research of Nieder studies. So as the brain does not make a big difference between something which it experiences in reality or something we are imagining to experience, I did something very logical. I tried to induce uh, near-death-like experiences in my clients, and I started with using hypnotherapy. So I put my clients into a state of hypnosis and then suggested to them the elements of a near-death experience, go coming closer and closer to a very bright light, which gets more and more intense. And by doing that, I had quite remarkable results, but for some clients it was very hard when they uh, were sitting with their closed eyes in a state of trance to imagining uh, a bright light. And some of the clients tried so hard to do that uh, that they pulled themselves out of the trance state. At that time, I used a hand lamp, a very bright hand lamp, and when the clients were sitting in front of me with their eyes closed, I put the lamp closer and closer to their eyes as I was saying, things like and now the bright light is coming closer and closer and you're breathing in the light and you get totally immersed in the light and things like that and this has a tremendous effect on the clients and after such kind of hypnosis I heard them say things as I was used to hear after near-death experiences because I did also a lot of interviews with people who had near-death experiences and there were pe uh, p uh, clients who told me exactly the same say, saying things like I had the impression that that time comes to a standstill and that I've been at a place it's hard to describe where everything is at the same time and, and things like that. So at that uh, point uh, my colleague Dirk Bröckel, a neurologist and a psychologist joined me and he had the idea that by using a flickering light just uh, to induce some kind of acceleration uh, experience just like going through a tunnel or something could help uh, even better for the people uh, to tune into a near-death-like experience. So we had our uh, espresso machine in my office rebuilt as a kind of light and around the halogen light flickering lights. Uh, and when we sit in front of that light for the, it was just white light, uh, sitting in front of that for the first time, uh, we were totally blown away by the effect because we never expected something like that. We, we, we went into beautiful colors and sceneries and having vivid uh, optical hallucinations and a state of mind which you usually reach after many years of uh, trained meditation. So Dirk saw that when you go into that state, sitting in front of the lamp, after some minutes in the EEG of the brain, you can see harmonics going all over the brain, which uh, are also shown with uh, Buddhistic monks who are in deep meditation, things like that. And so, so the whole thing, uh, once I started, and yeah. <laughs> the heliotropic breathing is something very simple. Um, when, when I was uh, at the university, a colleague of mine, he did that holotropic breath work, uh, which was developed by Stanislav Grove, to induce also a very deep uh, altered state of consciousness. And uh, it never worked with me. I did it and tried it many times, but I, I could not use it to to alter my state of consciousness. My hands get cramped and all these uh, things of hyperventilation, they, they occurred also to me, but no, no relevant change of consciousness, I would say. But uh, after using the lamp, um, I found it very, very easy to change my breathing uh, in a way that uh, the experience got deeper and deeper. Especially, uh, I found out that if I kept, kept my breath for a certain time, the experience gets deeper and deeper, and also with just a constant light. So I developed a very simple breathing technique, uh, which I would say is nothing very special and nothing very new, because a lot of uh, therapists, and also in the, in the religious tradition, you find a lot, uh, especially in Tibet, they developed a kind of tummo breathing, it's called there. It's exactly the same principle. Breathing for a certain amount of time, and then stop breathing, and tune into that stillness in a way 
that uh, makes a profound shift in your uh, consciousness. And so I combined it with the lamp and uh, it's very practical in when I'm working with clients because then I use the lamp to induce for the first time a very deep experience in that state of consciousness and then I show my clients how to use the breathing technique so that they can uh, reach the same uh, state of consciousness also without uh, the neurostimulator, uh, without the, the uh, Lucia number three, but just sitting in the sun, making, uh, closing the eyes and doing that kind of breath work uh, with the sun or with a very bright light has ex exactly the same effect. So uh, th this is very important because um, as the lamp, uh, the, the neurostimulator Lucia number, dry, number three induces immediately a, a profound shift in consciousness people sometimes tend to attribute the effect to the lamp, which is not true. The effect is made by the client himself, by the one who is using the lamp. So the lamp is just giving a stimulus and the brain reacts in a way that it shows uh, what it can do. Um, and once you get into that state of consciousness, it's quite easy to go into it again because then you know what you're looking for. Lucia number three is the name of our optical neurostimulator. It is nothing but a lamp with a constant light in the middle surrounded by flickering, by LEDs which can do the flickering in any uh, combination of frequencies. And it's just white light and by that combination, especially that combination with the constant light, uh, not just the flickering alone, I would say the therapeutic effect is in the constant light. The flickering just prepares the brain uh, to go into that experience. So by using these kind of technologies, the constant light and the flickering light, uh, it's very, very easy for the brain to tune into that state of consciousness where you lose your um, normal state of consciousness and go much beyond that. Primero, eh, soy especialista en anestesia. Después me especialicé en tratamiento del dolor crónico. Después me especialicé en tratamiento del trauma psíquico. ¿Por qué? Porque la mayoría de los pacientes con dolor crónico han sufrido traumas en la infancia. ¿Ok? Luego aprendí acupuntura y entre varias técnicas de acupuntura hay una que es llamada auriculoterapia que trabaja sobre puntos de la oreja. Que usted puede poner agujas o puede aplicar color sobre la oreja. Doctor Daniel Asís, bavise auricularnom cromoterapia kojom se preko različitih točaka na ljudskom uhu dolazi do mnogih dijelova ljudskog tijela. Između ostalog i do limbičkog sustava preko kojeg se utječe na emocije i tako se ljudi rješavaju razno raznih traumi. De manera que en la oreja hay una zona que guarda los recuerdos psicológicos traumáticos. Entonces, si usted aplica color puede borrar o tratar los traumas psíquicos. ¿Ok? okay. Esa es mi relación con el color. Investigué con cuál color puede tratarse el trauma psíquico. Con color. 30 years ago. 30 años atrás estuve interesado en estudiar la auriculoterapia. Es una técnica de origen francés desarrollada por el doctor Noyer de Lyon, Francia. Eh, todo el cuerpo humano está representado en la oreja. Entonces yo estudié eh, en profundidad ese tema con el hijo del doctor Noyer, que es profesor de auriculoterapia, y me concentré en el tratamiento del trauma psíquico. Porque todas las personas que sufren enfermedades han sufrido traumas en su infancia. 
y pueden ser tratadas con color. Es por eso que yo empecé a estudiar el color. La persona, la primera persona que conocí que investigaba el color es una persona, la doctora Tina Karu, que vive en Rusia. Ella tiene un laboratorio en Rusia para investigar el color. Y entonces me acerqué a la Asociación Internacional, eh, International Light Association. Eh, el color es una onda electromagnética. Tiene una acción electromagnética. Y si usted proyecta un color sobre un punto de acupuntura o sobre un punto de la oreja, va a tener un efecto biológico positivo. Esa es la relación de que hay que tratar. Es una técnica con el color en puntos, ya sea de acupuntura o puntos en la auriculoterapia. Es una onda electromagnética, no es magia. I studied in Vienna ecology and in Denmark um, agricultural science. Got specialized 10 years in different universities in water chemistry. And then I heard about Dr. Masaru Emoto and his water crystals. I was not a big fan of him. I thought, what a nonsense, crystals, beauty, all this has nothing to do with chemistry. But anyway, we met and he invited me to Japan and I was allowed to look through the microscope and work in Japan with Dr. Emoto. And I saw that there is much more than what we learn in the university. Rasmus Gauberhausen is a student from Austria, who has developed a special method of taking different variations that have individuals in the heart and in the light of the fight. I started to work in that field, and Dr. Emoto asked me to open a laboratory in Europe making his work. So this was 2004. And, and I traveled a lot with Dr. Emoto to many countries around the world, helping him, later giving my own lectures. And yeah, that's how everything started. And then the next thing is that I worked a lot in Russia, and I learned about a technology, or let's say first about a knowledge, which is called heart rate variability, the heart beat, which is always different, changing. And I developed a technology which translates your heart frequency into light and into sound. So I take your frequency and I calculate it into sound and light. You can imagine it's like this. You have a tuning fork, you know, a tuning fork in music. You hit it and it springs. And if you have a second tuning fork, you hit one, the second one starts to vibrate. That's resonance, very simple. And now the interesting thing is if you have here Do and you hit it, the other Do will vibrate like in piano, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. If you hit the door here, this door vibrates, but also the next door, the octave higher, also vibrates. And the next door vibrates, you understand? They all start to resonate by itself. So the philosophy and the idea that behind this is I take your heart frequency and I translate it like a tuning fork, higher, 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 faster, faster, into the sound and into the light. So your heart, as I show you in the picture, your heart frequency is translated into sound and light. Yeah, and the ILA, the International Light Association, um, they invited me to give a lecture in Vienna three years ago, I think. And they were very interested in my work. And well, and then I gave another lecture last year in, in Oslo. And now I'm here and give my third lecture. So that's the whole story, very, very short, yes. Well, heart rate variability means that your heartbeat is always changing, always different. This is a very old knowledge. Chinese people, Chinese doctors know this since 1,700 years, almost 2,000 years. They know the more variable your heartbeat, the more easy you can heal yourself, the more easy you adapt to stress. They know the better the variability, the better for you. Today, we have 23,000 studies on the market telling exactly the same. The better, the more variable your heartbeat, the better. So, today we know the cause of death number one in our Western society is heart problem, brain problem, is blood circulation problem. Like number one is the heart attack, 
long before cancer and diabetes, whatever you have. So it's a very big problem in our society. So now we know the bigger your heart rate variability, the better you can adapt to stress, the better you can heal. Now the thing is, so this is just common knowledge. Even most people don't know, but this is just common knowledge. Now it's like this. Normally medicine it's like this, no matter what medicine, if you are sick from outside, you get a correction. No? If you're sick, you get a pill or a treatment or whatever. So you're the problem and from outside they help you. Good or bad, whatever, but that's the approach. You're the problem from outside. My approach is there that there is nothing better in the whole universe than you. That's why you are you and not the other guy. So my philosophy is I take your frequency and I, it's like a mirror and I translate it into a frequency back which you understand. And this is sound and light. Because if I put my ear to your heart, it makes maybe bum, 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 but it's maybe nice, but it's not so touching or whatever. So I translate this frequency range into sound and into light. So I, for example, I take whatever instrument, the violin, the harp, and your heart, you can imagine your heart literally presses the key of the piano. So your heart starts to play. So you listen what your heart is playing. And then I translate the sound to light. So if you play a do, like do, re, mi, fa, so on the piano, the light is green. I tra directly translate it into light. So you start to play. And when I launched this, 2010, I think, now it's in 25 countries. I thought nobody's interested in this. Now it's in 25 countries, as far as I know. I think 25, 26, I don't know. Um, and people working in all fields. So I have oncologists working with this, gynecologists working with healers, mothers, therapists, teacher. It's all kinds of field people working with this. So um, this is the work. The main approach is that I take your frequency and translate it back into sound and light. That's all. I take electrodes on your body, like an AKG, you know, AKG, electrocardiogram, and I take your signal. Okay, this is the first thing. I have a device, put electrodes here, and I get your signal. And then this signal is in the technology translated into an audio which has been recorded before. So a violin player, harp player, they played the notes and they are recorded. Like on a keyboard, you can imagine, just in the computer. So your frequency is taken by a device and goes into the computer, and then your heart says, I play this sound or this or this and then it goes out via audio. Or the device also connects to a lamp, and then the device says, okay, you play the door, the lamp is green, it plays a la, the lamp is yellow, and so on. This is how it works. And it goes further, I can connect you with your wife, or your child, or your grandmother, or your dog, <laughs> or your horse, I don't know what I take both hearts, translate them both into sound. So let's say you connect with your mother. Your mother plays the viola, you, you play the violin. And now there's a very big and a very interesting phenomena in this world. It's that your heart and my heart wants to connect. It sounds very esoteric, okay, like spiritual blah. Very simple. There is a phenomenon, it's called entrainment in, in, in science. If you have the wall full of pendulum watches, you know this watch, a watch with a pendulum going like this. And if you have many watches here, the same type, they will start during time to interact, communicate, you can say, react on each other. It's called entrainment. So imagine your heart is like a pendulum watch, okay? Has bum, 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 and my heart too. And this is a frequency. We have a very strong electromagnetic field. It's more than six meters, which means that his heart, all the hearts in the room, wants to communicate, like these watches. Nothing about esoterics. So I could take your frequency and this from your child or your mom, and now I take these two frequencies and translate them into sound, and now I can listen how these two instruments, these two sounds, starts to interact. And we see this by pregnant women, by coma patient, by animals. Why I mention the three is because a coma patient, a baby and the mom, and the animal, they don't understand what I'm explaining you here. But we can see how they react. That's what we're doing. So we take the heart frequency, translate it into sound and light from one or two person, and then we 
and you experience it. And at the same time, here we can, can show, <laughs> we, we make an evaluation. So we make a several page heart rate variability evaluation. So even if I know nothing about you, if I connected you, let's say a couple of minutes, I know the stress resilience, I know the stress level, the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, the total energy. You get a lot of data out of this person. And at the same time, we can, for example, here you can beautifully see before and after treatment how the, the how to say, the changes. That's the amazing thing. Normally in science, when I take now a water here, I examine everything except the water. I say this is how much nitrate inside, this is the pH, this is this and this is that, this is the pesticides. But the water itself is much more than the sum of the elements. I got specialized in Vienna. We had hormones, they were radioactive labeled, like radioactive marked hormones, and we tried to clean it. Very, very accurate science. Very beautiful, very nice science. And I thought this is wonderful, we know everything about. But if I, now we are, let's say, five people in this room. I know we are five people, or six people. Would this be enough? There is much more, no? Every person has a story, there is much more information inside. The word information literally means a vibration changed into form. So there is very famous this chromatics. Maybe you heard about chromatics. You take sand, you make this vibration, and you get these forms. Jenny and the different people made this in former days today. Many people do this. So it makes, and now a very interesting thing is in science, there is nothing about beauty. In scientific world, we need numbers. How much pH, how much whatever inside. But there's in old science, there was also something about beauty. Now what is beauty? Beauty literally are harmonics, mathematical numbers which are like music intervals, which sound nice. If you have no education in music whatsoever, and if I play a nice da-da-dum, you would say, oh, this sounds nice. And if I play da-da, not nice, you would say, oh, it sounds not nice. So you don't need to be a musician to listen that it sounds nice or not nice. Why? Because the mathematical proportions can be right or wrong. OK? Good. But in science, it's like this, that we have lost this track. We are just interested about numbers. So, and now the old science, like in Egypt, Babylon, India, everywhere, if you go to Notre Dame, every window has a special proportion to the next window, to the door. These are like intervals in music. Yes, you understand? If I look at your face, if your eye would be here and the other eye would be here and the ear would be like this, it would be maybe very interesting, but it would not look very nice because there are no harmonics in your face anymore. Science nowadays is just looking on numbers and we lost the quality of harmonic sounds, harmonic shapes. And this is where Emoto and many others come into. So now I can take like this water, for example, wonderful water and look under the microscope and I see beautiful picture. So there's much more than just, if I look at you, I can say, okay, maybe you are 70 kilo heavy or 80, um, you're this size, you're this, would it, it describe anything about you? Very little, no? Some outside parameters. Maybe the neighbor is the same. It would not show how intelligent you are, how much smiling you are, anything. So the same is with water. There is much more to look about. And I love the normal science, chemistry, this is all wonderful, but there is much more. And Emoto showed beautifully that the structure under the microscope is another quality. And I always looked for quality. Before I, I thought if I take all the matter inside, all what I find, pesticides, nutrients, everything, I know about the water. But I then it's like you. I know just how heavy you are, how big you are, how fast you run, but I, what do I know actually about you? And this is what we do. And the work I do today, I still do the water testing from Emoto, but my main work actually today, I, I do a lot of testing, is Emoto helped me a lot, and he said what we're doing about the sound translation of the heart to, to light and sound um, has to come out. So this is my main work today.